So first of all, thank you very much. I am really excited to be here. I just understood that this seminar was born out of the need uh, of, of the COVID crisis. And I congratulate the organizers to, to run this on a large scale, international scale. And as I just uh, mentioned to Philip, I, and he mentioned it also. So I, I am mostly a mathematical kind of person who is fortunate enough to work with geomorphologists most of the time. And uh, because this is a video seminar, which I think it's, it's a great opportunity, but it somehow restricts the amount of information flowing back and forth. I saw that today, I would speak about a problem which uh, uh, was very much uh, a, a very close collaboration with geologists. And maybe the whole topic uh, may sound familiar to some of you. So I have been working with a group in Pisa uh, who about, and, and, and they are very much interested in the, in the fate of the beaches there. These are, they, these are very beautiful pebbles, by the way. And uh, they, Pisa is, is very close to the, um, to the Carrara. And all these pebbles, which you can see here, are brought down from the mountains um, from Carrara. So this is Carrara marble. And uh, it, it is just... Uh, if you have the opportunity to visit, it's, it's, it's a sight. I mean, this, this, this kind of marble pebbles on the beaches. And each year, these beaches are being replenished, replenished because uh, pebbles get lost and, and they get eroded. And this is a major problem uh, for this community that, that they, they, they pebble, why they lose so many pebbles. So we started to work together uh, this group, and I would like to emphasize Giusto Bertoni, most of all, he's, he's the, probably the main person here. And uh, there are other people involved in this work, uh, whom I also mentioned, Esther Ferry, who is from my group, Doug Jeromak, many of you may know, he's at University of Pennsylvania, Ferenc Kuhn from Hungary, Balázs Ludmain, he's my student, Alessandro Podzebon, Giovanni Sarti, are also from Pisa and other shippers from Budapest. And I am just talking about a slice of this, co of this cooperation. So what they are doing, they put in radio tagged pebbles into these beaches and they try to track them. And after some conversation, I, uh, we, we agreed to do this on a very large scale in terms of time. So, so to track them for a very long time. And uh, what we measured was that in about one year, we tracked we track them for one year, uh, they lost about uh, uh, over 50% of their mass. So that's huge. And that would account for what's happening at these beaches mostly. So maybe pebbles are not so much carried away by the wave current as they lose their mass in, in abrasion. And their main interest was to keep track of this abrasion. So this is, this, we are talking about aggressive abrasion. So these are very energetic beaches. We encountered major storms in this one year. And the recovery rate of the radio tech pebbles was not very good because of the, there were huge storms. And um, they, the question, the, 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 the scientific question, one was to measure the mass loss. And the other was, if we find pebbles, can we somehow deduce how much mass they lost based on their shape? So this is a reasonable question to ask. And uh, there are many beaches there. I'm just giving you one example of these beaches. There are many beaches. And, uh, and whether it might be possible to distinguish between those beaches just by analyzing pebble shape and not to do this large scale measurement at, at, at every beach, but just to look at pebble shape and tell how energetic that beach is. So that, that, is, the, that is the large question. And that is why I was brought into this work. So 
You know that Galilei was born in Pisa, but this citation from Galilei is irrespective of his birthplace is adequate here. So uh, he was he was he was a scientist philosopher, and he said that the book of nature is written in the language of mathematics, and the signs in that book are geometric figures. So we have to understand the geometric figures in order to understand this language. But how do we understand figures? That's a difficult question. So now I will be talking something which is more familiar uh, to you. This is fluvial aberration. And I'm sure many of you have encountered fluvial aberration and many of you know much more about fluvial, fluvial aberration than I do. So in that case, pebbles are being carried by the river and they saltate. And as they saltate, they collide with the riverbed, which is either the rock itself or it is pebbles of similar size. That's very important. Uh, as this is happening, they get rounded. And this is very easy to reproduce in a lab experiment. You just put some rectangular blocks into a steel drum and you see that things get around it. You can't get it wrong, by the way. It is very difficult to get it wrong. So in this process, to math mathematically to express this process is if, say, if you're looking at a projection of the contour of the pebble, what we see that it gets rounded, so it gets more close and close to the circle. One way to measure this which I think is also familiar and, and a commonplace thing to geomorphologists is the isoparametric ratio. Um, I just, may I ask that this is well known, I guess, right? This isoparametric ratio is, is, uh, is used or, uh, yeah, do I need to, to, to elaborate or is I it? Think it's, <laughs> Gabor, I think it's uh, it's quite well known, but maybe it might be good to give a, a short reminder of what it is exactly. Okay, okay, then short reminder. So this is a dimensionless quantity, which is between zero and one. And it is one if we have the circle only, and it is zero if we have something which is like a pin, which is very, very narrow. And it is expressed like the area divided by the square of the perimeter, the length of the perimeter, and four pi is just to normalize it between zero and one. So if something gets rounded, this ratio is increasing towards one. It is start at some value and it is increasing. So there are mathematical models describing this process. And uh, probably, the best known model is due to fiery, and this is called curvature driven abrasion. This means that you, what you saw here is how the contour of the pebble is moving inward under abrasion, and each point of this contour is moving with some speed. That is called V. Now, if we can V as a function of this contour of the local quantities, then we have an equation, then we have a model. So this looks like a very simple model because I said V equals C time kappa. It's a very simple equation, but this is a very complicated equation. It is just written in a very compact manner. If you, if you write it out, this is a nasty partial differential equation. V is the speed by which these points move inward in the direction of the normal. C is now for the time being just a constant and kappa is a curvature. So if, if it is like, if we have a vertex, then this curvature is infinite. And say here and the upper end, this is very small. The curvature is very small because it is almost flat and here the curvature is larger. Now, this is, this is a partial differential equation and we know that this is driving things towards the circle or the sphere in three dimensions. And um, this model has been tested in many, many, many ways, also in laboratory, in computations, experiments, and also uh, in the field. 
So this is a relatively well established model now. So curvature driven abrasion, driving pebbles, tovaspherical shapes. Um, now there is another case of aberration, which I would call Aeolian aberration. That is when the things are being aberrated by uh, particles which are much smaller than themselves. So say in desert, in the desert, desert rocks, which are called ventifacts, they are not being aberrated by collisions with other rocks, but they are being aberrated by collisions with sand grains. There are similar collisions, but the geometry is very different because the sand grain is so much smaller than the rock. And as you all know very well, and you can also see in this picture, they have radically different shapes. They are not rounded, rather they have sharp edges and corners. Now, this is not a result of fracture. This is the result of abrasion. So in some sense, this abrasion is the opposite of the other thing what we have seen. So in desert rocks, the emergence of edges and flat areas is, is a generic thing. You might expect it. If you would start a desert rock, you put down a big sphere or a spherical kind of thing, smooth thing in the desert. And after some while you would see these edges. And what is more surprising, this is nothing to do with the direction of the wind. Of course, wind has some direction, but even if the rock is being turned over, even if we assume that this is completely uh, isotropic, it is bombarded isotropically by the sand grains, still you will see edges emerging on these shapes. So the model is now, again, collisions between things, but now we have small things colliding with a large thing. And just that changes the whole setup. So here's a lab experiment. We put a chalk ball among very small steel balls in a drum. So abrasion was done between the steel balls and the chalk. And we got very strange shapes. As a result, you can see we got these little disks we got these cigar shapes, which had three edges, and we got things which are like a tetrahedron. So these were the output of this experiment. And as you can see, we started with something which was smooth and we ended up with something which was no, very, very non-smooth. So this was uh, also, in this case, as I said, we, even if we start with something spherical, we go away from the sphere. So we are moving away from the sphere and therefore the isoparametric ratio is going down. Things get more and more flat. They get more and more elongated. So they distance themselves from the sphere. Um, that is an interesting example of that. And um, maybe I mentioned that because we, we, we are not bad time-wise. So, you might have heard about this asteroid, this Oumuamua. And uh, the Harvard Smithsonian speculated that it may be a spaceship because the shape was like a cigar. It was 400 meters long and 40 meters in diameter. And uh, uh, we, are, we, we said, we don't know. We don't know, of course, of course we don't know whether it is a spaceship or not. But we said, if it was abraded in this manner, so it was flying in outer space, and it has many, many collisions with very small bodies compared to its own size, meteorites, then this is the generic outcome you might expect to see, this kind of longish thing or flattish thing. So this is not something which may, doesn't need to be man-made because this kind of abrasion is producing these shapes. And the reason we don't see this in the solar system, and in fact, don't see it among pebbles, you don't see this cigar shape, things, very longish things you don't see because they break. But if you are in interstellar space, you don't collide with anything big enough to break you. So you, you can get really, really elongated over a couple of hundred million years. Here, you can still see we get 
reasonably elongated things and reasonably flat things, not extremely. Flat is easier. Elongated is very bad. That, that breaks very easily. Now, there is an equation which does this job. So we have, again, an equation. What is the equation? Again, the equation is you take a contour, you drive it inward, and you prescribe the speed. Previously, I said, if you want to model rounding, you need curvature dependence. You need a curvature-driven equation. And here it is the constant speed. It is, sounds really boring. So V equals one. Now this is also a nasty partial differential equation, but it is written now in a super compact fashion. It is correct. There's no cheating, but if you want to write it out in a regular notation, this is, this is a complicated formula, but this is now just uniform speed. This is like wave propagation as you, uh, like a sound wave propagating with uniform speed, every, every, but now we are propagating inward, but otherwise this is the same equation. So uniformly propagating wave front, but we have an inward wave front and this inward wave front would develop what we call singularities. And these correspond to these edges and vertices and, 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 the op, and, and, and these geometric features which you, you can observe. So these are generic features. So again, we have a good model. Now, um, in the coastal setting, uh, many things can happen. So this is not a fluvial setting. Um, pebbles can collide with likewise pebbles. So they get rounded. They might be sliding on sand. So they might be abraded by sand. They might be abraded by smaller pebbles. They can just, uh, they can be called, they, they, they can be even sliding and just uh, being abraded by friction. So coastal, the coastal scenario is much more complex than the desert scenario or the fluvial scenario, which, which, which are relative. I would talk about fluvial scenario in the upper reaches of rivers when we have really energetic flow. In the lower part, it's more complicated. But in the coastal setting, it is a complicated process. So we have all kinds of things happening at the same time. And I don't, I wouldn't say it doesn't matter how you model these things, but uh, no matter how you model them, you will see uh, something which is rather strange. So we will see the isoparametric ratio being non-uniform, uh, non-monotonic. So initially things get rounded, then they might get more flat. So this function is not invertible anymore. It's not a monotonic function. It's not good because if you want to estimate um, mass loss from a shape, then you need something which is monotonic. You need something which is invertible. So if you measure a mass loss, you, if, you, if you have some shape measurement, you can tell the mass loss. In a fluvial setting, the isoparametric ratio is pretty good. In a purely Aeolian setting, it is pretty good because it's monotonic. But in this kind of coastal setting where any things are going on, it's complicated, it's not very good. It's not isoparametric ratio, it's just not, not one thing what you can use to estimate how much mass has been lost because things might move in various ways in terms of the isoparametric ratio. Um, so now we jump because I just explained to you, we wrote a paper where we uh, claim that in the fluvial environment, the isoparametric ratio is a pretty good scale, a pretty good, a pretty good tool to estimate mass loss. But here it is not, here it is definitely not. And here we need something very different from the isoparametric ratio. So this is, this is just a cartoon, okay? Here you can see the isoparametric ratio, natural fragments are close to 0.78 or in that area. So in the fluvial setting, you see 
that we are approaching one, maybe not one, but getting close. And uh, in the Aeolian setting, we we just get more flat or more more thin. Now in the coastal setting, different things may occur. So we have to throw it out. This is this is this is not this is not the tool what we want. But do you know my colleague wanted me to help him to go to pebbles sites, collect pebbles, and tell from the shape what is the mass loss. And this isoperimeter case you wouldn't do. So now we jump. Okay. So this is a dice, and you are familiar with the dice. It it has six faces and if it is not loaded, then the probability of falling to any of these faces is equal. If it is loaded, then it is not so equal. And um, here are coins. Coins have two sides. Those are possible. This is proverbial. There are other objects which have many other. This is what we call a stable position. We put it down and it stays like that. It is called a stable position, a stable point of equilibrium. Now there are also unstable points, like um, the cube has eight vertices. It has six faces, so S equals six, and it has eight vertices. Um, anybody wondering about the edges? David. <laughs> anybody wondering about the edges? Yeah, so you don't need to count the edges. <clears throat> there are edges, and as you all know, there are 12 edges. But there is a famous Euler theorem and the Poincare Hoff theorem. So based on those, we know that <clears throat> if we know the number of stable points and we know the number of maxima unstable points, then we can comp compute the third number. So S plus U minus H is equal to two. So in this case, six plus eight minus 12 is equal to two, but this is a zero and it, it is always two, not just in this case, it is always two. It is also two for these complicated guys. So that is a number or to be more precise, two numbers which are associated with a shape. It is not reversible. So if I tell you these two numbers, you can't tell me what is the shape. But if you give me a shape, I can tell you these numbers. These numbers are hard wired into that shape. Now you may say this is very little information. I agree, it is very little information, but uh, I have two excuses. One, I am not looking at one pebble. I will be looking at zillions of pebbles. So then I get some statistics and then this information may be not so bad. And the other uh, idea is that these are integer numbers and it's hard to underestimate the beauty and attraction of integers. Any of you, I hope that all of you have a bank account and all those bank accounts are identified not by little drawings or irrational numbers, but by integers. And you would be very scared if you each time to identify yourself, you had to do exactly the same drawing. It is not secure, but giving the numbers, that, 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 that is somehow what we feel comfortable with. So knowing integers is a qualitatively different story. So there may be a meager source of information, but there is no, um, no arbitrariness. These numbers are in the shape. I don't decide what they are. The shape decides what are these numbers. And they are the most beautiful things on earth. They are integer numbers. So let's look at these numbers. So how do we determine these numbers? I can tell you it's relatively easy. In 99% of the cases, it takes just three to five seconds. You take 
the pebble in your hand, you put it down and to find the number of stable positions, it, even you have to look at it in many cases, it's just two sides. And then to find the number of unstable positions, if the pebble is flat, as 99% of cost of pebbles are flat, then you just balance it in its main plane. You let it roll in that plane, and then you count. And the, the number of positions it can find along that perimeter is the number of unstable balance points. So in this case, it's like a triangular shaped thing, and it has two stable and three unstable balance points. An ellipsoid has two stable balance points, two unstable, and it has also two saddle points. So this is called the primary equilibrium class of a pebble. And uh, this is a shape descriptor. It, it doesn't look good to you because it is not like an aspect ratio, what geologists love, or the isoparametric ratio. So they are not real numbers, they are just integers. But integers um, are nice things. So we can classify shapes. So here you see this is the cube. We put them into this matrix, and the rows are the stable points, and the columns are the unstable points. And we don't need any third dimension. So the, so the cube is in row six and column eight, because it has six faces, and it has eight vertices. And we can put here other objects, like this is an octahedron, this is a tetrahedron, tetrahedron has four faces and four vertices, this is the ellipsoid, it has two and two. Now, there is an algorithm, this is, I would call this is a theorem, that if you have any object in any of these categories, which I call primary classes, then you can have an object to the right, and below. This is, in, in layman terms, you take a sharp knife and you chop off in a very direct way some parts of that object and you can increase this number very easily. That's a theorem. <clears throat> and also there was a conjecture that this class up here is not empty. Now, assume that this theorem is Assume this conjecture is true and combine it with this theorem. What does it tell you? So assume that this conjecture is true and we combine it with this theorem. What does it tell you? David. So we assume that this conjecture is true. This class is not empty. And we know that we have this algorithm that we can always move to the right and we can move below. So what is the conclusion from these two facts? Okay, just a note in between. I think until now people could not unmute themselves. So I just activated this function. So I think now everybody- oh, maybe, have you... maybe there were many comments. We just didn't hear these comments, okay? <laughs> so. so I think everybody should now be able to unmute. Yes, can, can unmute, maybe somebody yes. check? So anybody has any volunteering, maybe David is volunteering to tell us. So what is the conclusion that if the Arnold's conjecture is true and we have an object here and we have this algorithm, what is the conclusion? David, you are still muted. You can fill the table. Okay, we got, <laughs> we got the answer from a Geo, geo, geomorphologist person. We can, you can fill the table. We have a zoo of shapes. The table is full. Yeah, the table is full. And indeed, we have the gumbok up there. And the table is full. I just gave you some examples. So we have a full zoo of shapes. So this is a good classification system. That means we, we can have all kinds of shapes. Actually, you can use it for crystal shapes. It is meaningful to use it for crystal shapes. Now, we know a lot about the evolution of these numbers, and uh, which I'm not telling you today. That would be a long mathematical talk, which I am sparing you. But these numbers are going down. No matter 
what you do with a shape. I mean, in terms of natural aberration, you can't destroy this. This is some very deep thing in nature. So no matter what you do, this number is going down. And natural fragments, I wrote 16, doesn't mean 16, but they are around 16. Now we know a lot more about that. So maybe 16, 18. So they start there and ellipsoids are six. It never goes below six. Uh, that has physical reasons. It has mathematical reasons. It stops short of six, but it always goes down. And it doesn't matter whether it is a curvature driven thing or it is an Aeolian thing or whether it is friction, it just goes down. Now, uh, this would maybe say that this is the most boring thing what you have seen in your life because everything goes down. But this is a good thing because that means that this is a monotonic function. And if you have any kind of measurements, any ideas, in which range this should move, then you can measure these numbers. Okay, we are not, we are going to the beach, counting these numbers, compute the averages, and the average will tell you where you are. And um, what we have observed, and because we recovered so few pebbles, we, we actually started with 300 pebbles, 300 radio tech pebbles. Each of them had to be drilled, radio transmitter inserted. And then in the end, we recovered only, uh, I think one and a half dozen. So it's really very low recovery rate. So to do a meaningful statistics at this stage would be premature, but still we went too many beaches. And what you can see that, uh, first of all, in the case of coastal abrasion, uh, this number gets to the lowest. So it will approach six. So you have seen more beaches than I do. And there are beaches where you go there and there's only this very flat ellipsoidal pebbles. Then, then you are very close to six. There are beaches though, where you can see more rounded pebbles and this number will be higher. And uh, however, so here is again this summary, this kind of cartoon. And uh, now we can speculate. This is uh, at this stage because we have recovered so not so many pebbles. It's it's more like a speculation. Oh, this was. I, I showed you this before. This is just measurement of equilibria. So we can measure these things also in an automated fashion. So if we scan pebbles, then of course we can tell you how many equilibria it has. That, that, so it, it can be fully computerized. But hand experiments are rather fast and rather reliable. So we actually want the instrument that we have a great lab technician and we wanted to recover his measurements with the computer. And that was, uh, that was the benchmark. And the computer can recover those, those, those things uh, pretty accurately. It is not a trivial, I can explain why, but it can be done once you have a well-tuned software, it's just like this. And uh, my vision of, of sedimentology is that I know that, that people who are looking at um, Animals have databases where there are bones in three dimensions stored and you can download them and you can compare them. I think uh, sedimentology should also start to have databases where you have three dimensional images of particles uploaded and then anybody can access it and, and compute all the data because each time somebody goes and makes a measurement and somebody else wants to do some different measurement on the same data set, it's impossible because it, it, it has been discarded. It looks like a big energy, but I think the technology is here. So now you can do a scan in about two minutes for a pedal. And then once the scan is ready, tons of data can be, uh, can be excavated from that scan. 
I am here talking only about the number of balance points, but there is other data hidden in that shape, which can be done only by computer, not by hand. I would say there are other integers, not just these two integers, which I was talking to. There are many integers written in that shape. And the scanned image is an open book. We can, we can read it. We can read it. Here are some examples. And this is the comparison between hand measurements and, and computer measurements. And we got a very good match between those two. So this is the one is a manual and the other is a computer. So, so the computer is reproducing what we expect. Now, in three dimensions, the number of balance points is going down in a probabilistic manner. So um, in most of the cases, uh, the likelihood of getting lower numbers is much higher than getting a higher number. There is a barrier due to friction, which is never passed by any of these pebbles. And therefore, uh, this is a, a Markov process. Um, the stationary distribution of which is easily computed. So imagine you play chess on this chessboard, and the rule is that it's probability A, you have to move up, probability B to the left, but these probabilities are not equal. And the probability of going up or to the left is always higher than going to the right or below. In the end, if you play this with many little figures, you end up in the upper left corner and uh, but not exactly in that corner, but around that corner. That distribution, what we call a steady state distribution that can be computed exactly. It's a geometric distribution. So we collected some pebbles in, on the coast of Rhodes. We put them into this table. We classified them and then we superposed the data with the prediction. And the data says that it's a very good match. So you can see, that, and, and you will confirm without ever having done this. If you go to a beach, you will find most pebbles in this class. These are the two, two pebbles, the ellipsoidal pebbles. And uh, if you find anything here or here, you can sell it for big money because these are very rare pebbles. If you find anything in the first column or the first row, keep it. Don't throw it away. They are valuable things. If you find a gombok on the beach, then you are a rich person, I can tell you. But as for the rest, for the non-monostatic things, this is not just, you can say, okay, the majority is here, but it, they follow a particular rule. It, it's, it's a, it is a good, good overlap, good two-dimensional overlap with the data. So it makes a good prediction. And um, if you are looking at various beaches, then what you will find is that if the beach is uh, like high energy, then these numbers get lower. If the beach is low energy, then the beach uh, then then the numbers are higher. So our assumption is that. Uh, we didn't do that. So this is work in progress. Our assumption is that by looking at beaches where we know the energy level, we know whether big storms are visiting this beach quite often, whether the wave current is energetic or not. So we, we, are, fam we are familiar with the beach. The shapes and the number of balance points should correspond to that of the stationary distribution. And then, if we fill in the beach with new pebbles from the, uh, from the Carrara uh, uh, marble, then we will know at some point, if we collect the pebbles, we count these numbers, we will know where we are on this curve because this curve is invertible. This curve is a monotonic curve. And then we can say, okay, we lost, just by discounting these numbers, we can say we lost this amount of mass. It is, something to be done. The problem is we, 
We could do it on a large scale without tagging the paddles, but uh, my colleagues are very eager to do the tagging. The COVID was not very useful in this respect. We wanted to complete it um, last year. Do Cho, am I saying it right? But uh, we will persist and we will do it. After the COVID is over, we will do it again. So we are very, very keen to find this and make these measurements on these beaches, uh, preferably with tag pebbles, because then we can tag everything. We would scan every single pebble. That is the plan, to scan them, have a time evolution of the shapes, and have a complete curves, have these complete curves verified by statistical data. So now we are back to Barbarossa Beach. Gabo? Yeah. I think there's a question in between. So maybe as this seems like a natural break, we can allow this question. That's okay yeah. for you? Sure, sure, sure. David, but David, you are mu muted. Uh, good board. Tell me about initial conditions and sensitivity to them in that plot of your uh, okay, good. high energy versus low energy. Uh, yeah. Initial conditions, right? Yeah. So that would have been another talk. But <laughs> but now um, we know what are the initial conditions. When we did this with Ducho, we were just kind of conjecturing. But now we know that if you take these marble fragments, we know that on average, they are uh, cubes in the sense that if you count the number of faces and vertices, average is six faces and eight vertices and uh, 12 edges. Uh, that is for a generic kind of fragmentation. And an ideal cube would have 26 balance points, but these fragments are not ideal cubes. They, they're actually not cubes in the sense that I said the average number is six faces and eight vertices. That does not mean that the most common topology for a fragment is some cubic thing. It is not. Just the numbers, the average, the numbers average at six and eight. So therefore, the average number of balance points is way below the ideal cubes number, way below. We don't know how much below. That is another five years of thinking. That is a beautiful mathematical question which you can ask and uh, nobody knows the answer. What I am telling you here is just, we know the upper bound, which is 26, and we have lots of measurements. Now the measurements tell us it is between 16 and 20. So that is that is what we what we have measured. Uh, it would and but it is a universal question. There is no there are, if you assume generic fragmentation, there are no parameters in this problem. This is just a number. It is a number around there. So that is the initial value. And then uh, we are going downwards. So initially. Um, this fragmented rock will collide, the corners will come off. Any, any of you in this audience, now you know it is very, uh, very important to, to use disinfectant because of the virus. Any of you is using a bar soap still? If so, Michael is using a bar soap. So if, you, if you, this is the case, next time you use it, Pay attention because when you buy the bar soap, it, it's a rectangular block. It has six stable balance points. And as you use it each day, try. And you will notice that this number will go down. The more diligent you are with cleaning yourself, the faster it will go down. And you will end up with just two. And it doesn't matter. I am not, I am not marketing any particular kind of bar soap here because no matter what brand you buy, you will find the same thing. This is again a universal mathematical thing. So this will happen to the blocks of, of, of 
Maybe not every beach is as beautiful as Barbarossa Beach with the marble pebbles, but it doesn't matter. It, this will happen to the blocks. But this would be a full hour different talk. In uh, other slides, that is what I wanted to do, but I didn't dare to do because I said, this is a video talk. I was not hoping that people would share their faces. This is not very good for me, but still, Getting feedback on a video talk is difficult and, and, and talking about the fragmentation and geometry is probably one step further away from mainstream geomorphology. So that is why I not opted for this, but apparently in the audience, there are people who are actively interested in that. <laughs> for instance, I can't even tell why David is interested, but he is, okay. Thank you. Thank you for the question, David. Uh, Paul Carling here. Could I make some comments, please? Which sure, sure. Um, yeah, the initial conditions uh, is particular uh, area that I would be interested in. I've just completed some tumbling experiments. Uh -huh. uh, if you take the same geometric shape, an oblong or a cube, uh, you may end up with the final ellipsoid form but the direction of travel is, is different, although geometrically they have the same number of faces and, and edges. Uh, you know, a, a, a oblong shape tends to roll along the long axis and becomes oh, yeah. uh, more rod-like, while okay. a cube becomes more spherical. Okay. And the other, key, the other key issue is, uh, I think the other speaker mentioned this, um, the speed because the way the particles move changes depending if they're moving slowly or if they're moving at high speed. And that changes which points where more. So I think um, if you look at your shape data uh, in more detail and you, you've implied that you have done, I think the trajectories of travel would be very interesting to explore. I absolutely agree. And that would be a third <laughs> talk. So actually, what we are trying to understand now is, um, uh, so in a coastal setting, what happens is mostly um, pebbles um, roll, okay? And they move, may roll around the, and an ellipsoid can roll stably only around the shortest axis or the longest axis. The middle axis is unstable, or it can slide. And these are the motions which you may have observed in your experiment, I think. Now these motions uh, create a feedback mechanism because if something is longish, then it would tend to roll along, roll along its main axis. If something is like a disc, it will tend to roll around its small axis. And I fully agree the trajectories by which this pe the, this, this, this particles reduce this number may be very different. If you are looking at the evolution of the full shape, this view, which I presented today in very broad terms, just to look at the numbers, is a very, very strongly simplified view of the whole story. Uh, much more is hidden beneath it. And the same trajectory in terms of numbers may correspond to very different shape evolutions. I think this is what you indicated, Paul. Is that right? Yes, that's uh, right. I'm, I'm just making the point. I'm, I'm not. Yeah. I like, I, I, no, I, like I fully agree. I, I, fully I, like agree. What, I like what you've done, and I like the, uh, the conclusion that you tend to evolve to a, a standard shape. I, I, I fully agree. I fully agree. So this approach like counting, I would call it this counting approach, is uh, grossly simplifying things, but it does so in a legitimate way. So you are looking at a projection of this whole complicated process, which tells you one aspect of the process. Many aspects may remain hidden. And to find those, you need other shape descriptors. You may, you may have to track other shape descriptors. And once again, um, taking this opportunity, I, am, I would advocate for establishing a data bank where, where 
if you measure shapes, you just upload them and then people can look at it and excavate more data because there's so much data hidden in the shape, a large amount of data. And what, if we can co accomplish this, what we started with Ducho, we will have this shape evolution uh, marked in each in each phase. We will we will capture the not not just these numbers. We will capture the full shape, and then people can go back and understand how these numbers were born out. So, what was the shape evolution process? which resulted in these numbers. Maybe in five years, somebody finds a better shape descriptor, the data would be still there uh, to, to, to reconstruct everything. Um, and otherwise, the data itself is easily obtained and it is done, this is not a huge data set. I mean, this, this kind of files are just not, not big files. So it is not out of question, but I know it would be a new paradigm to to start this because everybody is measuring with little tools and this, this is a traditional way to do it. But now we broke with the traditional way of seminars because of COVID, <laughs> maybe, maybe we will do this also with, with data. So in any case, I, I back to Paul's question, I, I, I agree, I can see that I agree. So this is, this is a very limited view, but it's, it's an interesting view, but it's a very limited view of the whole process. Thank you very much. Thank you. Other questions? So I just remind to everyone that you can use the, the chat. So thank you, Gabor, for, for this talk. If you, you are finished, thanks a lot. Thank uh, you. So I remind everyone that you can use either the chat or you can directly maybe ask question to, to Gabor. The chat using... is disabled. Sorry. Sorry. The, the chat is disabled. <laughs> OK. <laughs> <laughs> so we and David, David, David wants to ask a question. Yeah, so uh, maybe yeah, it's a good way to uh, to force people to use the mic to to ask questions. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, Gabor, I, I wrote down six questions. I'm not going to ask all of you all of them. I'll 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 take I'll take most of them offline. We can exchange oh, good. email. Good. Um, uh, one of which is is purely mathematical in nature. But let me. Let me ask you a, a, a pointed question. Have you ever pondered the rings of Saturn? No. Uh, but I, I know that they are like consisting of this kind of particles, right? Correct. Okay, so I'll take that question offline and specifically. No, 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 no. I, I, I have seen it, but I have not thought about it. Yeah, okay, good. Uh, uh, Nikolai Brilliantov did uh, some wonderful work on uh, the evolution of the of the sizes of the particles in really? each individual ring. And so, my question, which I'll take offline, pertains to uh, their shapes. Uh, evidently, uh, we we have the capability of actually getting at uh, uh, sizes, and there are some interesting boundaries. On but, the, but on the distribution have, do, sizes. Do, do we have do we have any information on shape? Any? Well, I think well that's what I, I'm going to dig into that, and when I ask you offline, okay. I think the answer is yes. Really? And it would suggest your work would suggest that in any given ring, the ring actually sorts uh, spatially in size, but it does involve many many. Uh, uh, collisions and and uh -huh. it would suggest your work would suggest that there's not just a size sorting but perhaps also a sa a shape yeah. sorting yeah. as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll bring that up offline. Yeah. Uh, but Gabba, before we continue, sorry, maybe I got it wrong, but were you finished with your talk? Yeah, I am. Uh, I think I'm finished. Oh, okay. Sorry, because I thought you. Okay. We just one, had this. One, one more slide. One more slide. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> For the benefit of Ducho. For the benefit of Ducho, who has worked incredibly hard on this project. Now you can see this beach. And I gave this talk first in Pisa and I just picked this picture arbitrarily out of many other pictures. And this was the introductory picture for my talk. And then after I presented the slice, I noticed something in this picture. 
after I presented the talk first. And I wonder whether you notice it. Nobody has noticed it before. Uh, you really have to have a big screen to notice this, but it is very curious. So I, I didn't notice it. I just took a picture on the beach. No, and I put it into my presentation. It is, okay, so I will show you because I see that your eyes are bulging and you can't see it. It's, it's very hard to see. So this is the picture. And now you can see it. On that picture, you can see a tagged pebble, one of Ducho's pebbles, which was quietly sitting there without knowing that it will be the title picture. So that is the closing. That is the, oh, there you go. Here you go. It is a tagged pebble. So all these pebbles have been diligently drilled and tagged in the lab of the university. Okay, thank you very much. I am done and I am looking forward to David's uh, second question. <laughs> thank you, Gabor. So yes, if uh, David uh, has a second one. Um, may I, uh, because I have uh, a remark uh, in relation to uh, David's uh, last question. Um, I'm, I don't really know um, much about erosion, but uh, do you think it's possible to apply the same kind of erosion uh, that we see on pebbles uh, for like uh, Saturn rings? Because I feel like um, asteroids and uh, bodies in space have a very, very, very low cohesion. So this may probably have to be taken into account uh, for when regarding the, the size and uh, shape um, yeah. for pebbles in space. So the good news is that this theory of which I just told you this uh, broad outlines, this is a purely geometric theory. It has, it, has, it has nothing to do with the actual size of the things. As long as we are macroscopic, it has nothing to, it is not, doesn't go into the atomic thing. Um, it should work. So it is just, uh, there are no scales in this theory. And uh, the largest scale, so the smallest scale on which we have observed is are certainly the sand abraded particles. Uh, because then the sand is playing the part of the small brother and the big brother is the rock sitting in the, in the desert. But as I mentioned in space, asteroids are the big brothers and meteorites are the small brothers. Uh, David unintentionally or intentionally brought up the question of fragmentation we have observed this kind of geometric patterns, which our theory predicts also on the uh, larger scale as the tectonic plates are tiling the earth. So in general, I would say that it is hopeful to apply this theory to anything which is even remotely homogeneous and it is evolving by collisions. And the only parameter in this theory is the relative size of the things which collide. You might say that this, then this is a boring, simple theory. No, it is still a rather complicated theory. But there should be nothing to prevent this theory to predict uh, uh, things on other planets. Indeed, we did use this to predict the mass loss of pebbles on Mars where we knew that it was a fluvial environment. There we could use the isoparametric ratio, as I emphasized at the beginning. In a, in a steep river, that's good. We couldn't count. I would have volunteered to go there and count the balance points, but they didn't let me. What I am actually astonished at, that NASA and the European Space Agency, even today, they are shooting up, and the Chinese, they are shooting up these new missions to Mars. None of this 
has a real 3D imaging technology. It would be the most trivial thing. It is cheap. You go to the hardware store, you buy it. It is nothing special. And it would bring so valuable data back. And they have these kind of panoramic images and blah, blah, blah. But I mean, really, 3D, I mean, taking up a pebble and scanning it in 3D, that would be valuable. And um, therefore, we were using only the theory about the projections, but it seemed to work. So my question is, and my answer is, I am moderately optimistic about applying this to, to planetary problems because it is, it is purely geometric. Thank you for the question. Thank you, uh, Gabor. Um, so we have one question on the chat uh, from uh, Ein, Anne sorry, Vo Voigtlander. Sorry if I don't pronounce it correctly, uh, Anne. So thank you for this nice talk. Like your work a lot. Uh, from a geologist perspective, Carrara marble is both a very simple and as well a complicated type of rock. What about any other lithological preconditioning like texture or bedding? Uh, how it would impact maybe the, the relationship you, you, you mentioned. Okay. I was hoping for this kind of question. So once again, it's a dream to work with Carrara Marble, okay? Look at Duccio, he's smiling. It, it's a dream to work with Carrara Marble. It's a privilege to work with Carrara Marble. Michelangelo was working with it. But yeah, other lithologies are different. They have layers and so on and so on. Um, there are some aspects of this which would not prevail in if it is a kind of a structured rock. So if it is like has very preferred, it would always split in a certain direction. There are some of this theory which would not prevail, but there are other parts which would. So I mentioned the initial conditions, the cuboid shapes, the average cube. That does should not depend on the lithology, for example. Now, rounding would happen in a very different manner. If you have layers, because then they would, there would be a preferred direction. We looked into this. I tell you a problem, which is, I hope you will understand that it is a similar problem. I, we didn't look into lithologies computationally, but we looked into a problem which has the same flavor. We looked into the abrasion of uh, oh, a riverbed. If you have something sitting in the riverbed, okay, a big rock sitting in the riverbed. Um, I'm just trying to remember what is the name for that, Michael. Uh, some and some fruits, uh, river, fruits, river, river fruits and potholes. <laughs> yes, riverbed profiles. Now that. Is lithology is homogeneous, but the bombardment is not homogeneous. It is just coming from one side. So it is breaking this, the isotopy of the problem. The problem I was looking at was completely isotopic, things being bombarded by other particles. There are many ways to break this isotopy. One way is to look at lithologies which are structured. The other way is to, to break the symmetry in the bombardment. Now that we have done, and that was rather successful. So that was even on the experimental level, it could be verified. So my answer is, my humble answer is, I don't know about other lithologies, but I'm not completely hopeless. So this theory I described is about isotopy, but we already broke the isotopy in one particular fashion about directional pre preference because things move in one direction in the river. And that worked. We may be able to do a meaningful prediction how things change. Things will not change dramatically, by the way. So that, that is sure. They will not change dramatically. But quantitatively, they will change. And to make a meaningful quantitative prediction, I hope at some point we will be able to do. Thank you for the question about the lithology. Can I, can I ask one question? Sure. So the thing is that when you look at your picture, a lot of this a really nice white Carrara marble is there. 
you don't yeah. see any of the like lithology which has not been like this um, yes. but if you if you go to Carrara and if you go to the quarries there are only a few ones where Michelangelo would be very happy to take some rocks from right yeah. so yes. they're like three or four pits where you can actually get the rock you want to have for like a David statue but most yeah. of the other rock is is not there so I was wondering if you have if it's because so I've worked with Carrara marble. I like it very much. It's nice. It's very homogeneous, very fine grain size. And if you're lucky, you don't have any texture in it. You don't have any preferred orientation. Yeah. And yes. so it's perfect. But is it maybe you only see the perfect bits because the other ones have been like uh, the comminution has already uh, graded it down so much that you don't end up with a pebble size. Because well, the beach in, in Carrara, in Massa, in Carrara, uh, like the, the big city, um, where some of the rivers actually come from the quarries, only, like, you don't really see any of the highly foliated rocks. You don't see any of the ones where there's a lot of impurities in it. So only actually the really the white marble you will find yeah. at the beach. And, but when you go further up the river, you will find different ones, but I think mm -hmm. they're like abraded and uh, the comminution has been happening much earlier. So when you're actually arriving at the Mediterranean Sea, only the ones that are very uh, homogeneous and isotropic are actually remaining. So my answer is multi-layered like a rock. So the first layer of my answer is that um, we did look at other lithologies at other beaches, uh, but not here. But the second layer of my answer is that we are so fortunate to have one of the leading experts of the Pisa beaches sitting on this seminar. And I am just handing it over now to Ducho, who has seen more color marble pebbles than probably more than me, but more than most of us. So what do you think, Ducho, why wouldn't we not see other lithologies in the rivers coming down from the quarries? Uh, first of all, hi, everybody. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, OK, perfect, because I don't have the headset, so I uh, wasn't sure. Um, there's a, a, the first thing that I need to mention is that these beaches are artificial, are not natural. So uh, they were built 10 years ago, something like that, uh, to uh, contrast erosion processes along the uh, littoral cell in northern Tuscany. So basically rivers uh, do not um, supply those kinds of lithology to the sea. So there's no natural um, marble beaches in Tuscany. So everything you see here is artificial. So uh, those pebbles are just a, uh, the spoils of the um, uh, Carrara right. quarries. Yeah. So uh, I don't know if I answered the uh, but, but but the question was also that uh, Anna said that if you look at the rivers the creeks coming down from the quarries you don't see anything just this kind of marble Would no you agree? there's this no there's no marble coming down because uh, yeah. there's no basically um, creeks coming from the up one alps uh, and from the marble quarries so there are other kinds of uh, uh, lithologies, serpentine or uh, flint, something like that. So no uh, marble. And farther to the north, toward the uh, mouth of uh, the um, Magra River, you can find just uh, other kind of lithologies, but really gravel, not pebbles and the uh, beaches there are mixed sand and gravel so uh, it's hard to uh, make assessment on that so in any case 
I would recommend to everyone, once the COVID crisis has been lifted, these lockdowns to travel to Pisa and look at these beaches with their own eyes because they are just beautiful. And um, maybe you can see some of these big pieces from which Michelangelo uh, made the David. Um, but David had another question. Do you want to ask David or no? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so my second question, Gabor, uh, come back to the tumbling experiments that you showed where you have lots of little particles bombarding a single big, which is your ventifact versus uh, many particles of similar size. Let's now place that within the context of rarefied uh, bed load transport where uh, particles mostly, uh, moving particles mostly do not interact with each other, rather uh, rarefied particles are mostly interacting with the bed. So if I were to imagine an individual particle within a tumbler, which is colliding only with walls, it, with the walls of the tumbler, such that it is in effect abrading itself rather than being uh, abraded by many particles, how should I think about that in terms of its uh, likely evolution? Okay, uh, I completely skipped this in the talk. Uh, the theory tells us that the case when you collide with your peers, so like-sized particles, and the case where you only collide with something which is way bigger than you, is very similar. So things start to change when the incoming particles become much smaller than you are. So the case when you are solo and you are just bouncing along the riverbed, which is hard rock, is, is the same equation as if you bounce on things which are of your own size. Now, this is difficult stuff, but I hope I didn't even mention it. So thanks for bringing it up. Yes. So Alexander. Michael, you, you have a commentary to that? Alessandro wanted to ask a question. Yeah. First of all, thank you very much. And I just wanted to ask you this question now because it connects a bit to what David said. <clears throat> Am I wrong uh, if I understand that it actually the discriminant between the two types of evolution is related, yes, to the relative size of the particles, but actually to the relative frequency with which each uh, point on the surface of a particle is hit by another one? Because I imagine if they are similar of similar sizes, then the uh, probability of hitting edges is, or mm, yeah, edges is lower than surfaces, and the other way around with smaller particles. Yeah. So we are going to on deeper waters now. So what I was describing until now is what is called an individual abrasion theory. So we take one particle which is bombarded by others. And the relative size determines, this, that is the only parameter which plays in that model. But there is a more complex model where we talk about collective aberration. So we have, a, I would say, gas of particles. And then, of course, the probability of collision would also depend on size. So that is a more difficult question. And that's a, that's a separate issue. The theory for collective abrasion is resting on the theory of individual abrasion. Individual abrasion is the foundation for collective abrasion because any event would be like in the individual story. But how you pick those events would depend very much. So large particles would suffer more collisions, small particles would uh, suffer less collisions. And uh, that, is a, that is what I would call a statistical theory. And anybody is welcome to look at the web page of Earth Surface Dynamics, where there is a lively discussion going on between us and David about this theory. There is a manuscript there, which is under discussion. I love this, by the way. And that is exactly the issue. 
we don't know much about this collective process. We, in these manuscripts, we, we stated a few basic facts that it can do various things. And uh, your question is absolutely justified. So once we go to the collective process, we do have to consider many other things. And in particular, the relative probabilities of collisions, which would probably mostly depend on size. Um, in this frame, I would, if I hope I address at least the issue in your question, and I am very happy to discuss it, maybe in the context of that manuscript. Just brief, briefly, if I can, one sec, uh, because uh, you're also um, uh, stating several times that the, the evolution is relatively universal, let's say, is general. Yes. Yes. But nonetheless, we have seen in by the, the contribution of others today, and I also can think of other processes that, as we say, bring di di diversions di uh, from this universality. I, I can just think of the different probability of motions of uh, particles depending on size in riverbeds, which uh, affects the, uh, the probability of getting hit. So um, can you maybe suggest why you uh, are so convinced of the, the universality of the process, regardless of all the variability in the environment and the processes? Well, uh, as far what I was talking about today is the evolution of shape. Now, in this respect, uh, these collisions, how often they occur, they would only change the time scale. They would slow it down or speed it up. So as far as the geometry goes, that wouldn't change the thing. As far as the collective process is concerned, uh, the evolution for say the mass distribution, I don't claim that it is universal. The mass distribution of, if you take a, so a population of pebbles and you let it evolve, I don't think that the evolution of the distribution would be a universal thing. That would very much depend on, on the circumstances. And it could go various ways. What we show in this simple manuscript that it could go like this, it could go to a direct data, it could, e uh, spontaneously, it could produce dominant axis ratios, or it could disperse, and you could see completely homoge homogeneous thing where no axis ratio is dominant. So I don't claim any universality for the collective process. What I was saying that if you are an individual pebble in this process, you are suffering collisions, and by these collisions, your shape will evolve. Now, how often you are being collided by other pebbles would change the time scale. But on all of my plots, the horizontal axis was not time, it was mass loss. So time was factored out of these plots. And definitely, I don't claim a universal time scale for this, but what I claim that if you plot it as a function of mass loss, then the geometry would change in a universal manner. I don't claim universality for the time scale, and I don't claim universality for the collective evolution. So maybe this, uh, uh, with these amendments, might be more sympathetic to you. What I am saying. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mika. Mika. Smiling here. Can I make a comment or uh, sure, something? sure, sure. Uh, Paul or me. Um, I was just going to make an observation. Some of the questions and some of the things that have been discussed, there's, a, there's an enormous granular media literature in the, in the engineering publications. And uh, I've read a lot of that material and I, I could recommend that geologists start to try to get in to some of those journals. Uh, one particularly good one is Powder Technology which I guess a lot of engineer, a lot of uh, ge geologists don't read. And some, journal, yeah. some of the questions 
you will find answers in 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 those in those journals. It's a good it's a good place to mine for analogies to our natural processes on beaches and in rivers. Yeah, I, I can only just confirm that both our technologies are high level, as you know. It's, a, it's a very good thing. Uh, okay, David? Okay, I guess it would be Mikhail, but he's gone right now. <laughs> Mikhail is so, gone. <laughs> he's, oh no, he's back. We scared him away. No, uh, yeah, sorry, Mikhail, it's your turn now, I think. Sorry, what are the chances that uh, the postman comes? Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, no, that was great. My question was about the, so you said the number of equilibria goes down and you expect yes. it to go even further down when you have more storm, more energetic storm. But my impression is that if you've got big storms, you're more likely to break pebbles. And if you start considering yeah, the fragmentation yeah, when you yeah, break yeah, pebbles, yeah, yeah, yeah. then you're so going that, to, so is the trend going to be more like that or? Well, uh, we don't have the data. Right. So that, that I, I, I told you and I am still, so that was a kind of a speculative thing. I don't know. What okay. I sh I'm sure about is that it will tell the difference between the kind of yeah. beach you are looking at. Maybe what I told you, what is on the picture was not good. We did, that is not data-based and maybe mm -hmm. I shouldn't have shown anything. What, but what I strongly believe in, after having spent some time on the beaches and talking to Ducho who spent all his life on the beaches, <laughs> that <laughs> almost, that, that you will be able to tell the difference by counting. So that, that I bet a high amount of money that if you do the counting, you will be able to tell the difference between the beaches. And maybe that, that slide was just not, not very good. But mm -hmm. the, the message is that do the okay. counting and then yeah. But I fully take this point. I, I, I fully mm -hmm. justify. Yes, thank you. So the idea, so the idea of your talk was how getting like uh, abrasion rate out of pebble shape, uh, mass loss out of pebble shape. But uh, I was hoping you would just tell us this is how you do it, and uh, then you get your answer. But uh, yeah, it looks like it's going to be a bit more complicated than that. Isn't it? What what we have done until now is only the fluvial thing. That yeah, we have yeah. done in great detail. We have mm -hmm. done field experiments and lab experiments and everything. We have done our diligent homework. The coastal thing is more difficult because yeah. I don't have to explain to you why. It's just a big laboratory. It's, it's, it's not a time-wise, okay? The time scales, how do you track pebbles? In a, in a, in a, in a river, you can, it's a one-dimensional thing mm -hmm. on the coast. But I, I am very, very interested in the coastal thing and I, I don't know the answer yet. What I think is this counting approach, unlike the rivers where you just take the, I'm pretty sure that isoperimetric ratio is not good on the beach. And I am mostly sure that this counting will be significant. Maybe this is not the ultimate thing. Maybe you can do better, but this will be good. So I, I, I would bet on that, that this will be good on the beaches. And I hope that we will be able to do it in the future. So if anybody is yeah. on beaches and uploads it, we will be most happy to analyze the data. Yeah, Gabor, I actually would have a question myself that kind of follows up on what Mikhail just asked. So you were saying before again that the horizontal axis on your equilibrium balance point plots is actually mass loss. And, and maybe I just don't get it totally yet, but when you want to go back from your number of equilibrium balance points to mass or to mass loss, so taking your example of the soap, and you say you start off with soap, it's basically a square block. And then at some point when you use it, it reduces its shape and it has only like these two stable points. Yeah. But then at, at some point it only becomes smaller, right? It doesn't change the number of, yeah. of stable points again. So yeah. how do I know when I, when I look at the pebble at which size I actually started? And, and this is in the end what I need to know to, to estimate the, the total mass loss, right? Nah, yeah, 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 yeah. So what I say is that if you look at pebbles, you will never 
ever find a beach where every single pebble is an ellipsoid. That's not going to happen. So the average for balance points will be always higher than six, okay? And it will never ever become constant. Your single soap, yes, okay? But if you look at uh, zillions of pebbles on a beach, that's a completely different story. We are talking about the averages. The averages will, the averages will not stay constant. And uh, I, I strongly believe that if you look at large data sets, they will be smooth. And, 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 and they will approach limits. Uh, the more stable the conditions at the beach are, the better will be this convergence. So once we look at a beach, uh, maybe you are familiar with it. It's a famous beach for tourists in Greece. Uh, it's called the Navajo Beach, which is in an enclave of a high cliff. And everything on the beach is just coming down from that cliff fragments and they are buried there. So there is nothing. It is just a big laboratory. That's a very, very stable environment. Okay, It is just going on the same thing. There's no, no rivers, nothing. It's just fragments and abrasion and, and the wave current. And there you get averages, which are then the, the ensemble averages approaching six, like very closely, but that's a super stable environment. With, 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 so yes, your soap will uh, lock into that. But I think that uh, if you look at a beach, it will not lock. It will, it will approach, it will be asymptotically approaching this. And as I think David or Mikhail, Mikhail indicated, there will be cases where things break. So it will be not like a frozen thing, never, never be a frozen thing. And, 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 and this approach, so don't imagine to find an average of 6.2 on, on, on a beach. That, that's, that's unlikely. So things are much further away. So this is a big range from 26 to six. This is a huge range. So uh, your comment might suggest you might not be able to distinguish because everything is logged into this ellipsoidal thing. No, that's, that's not going to happen. That's, a, that's not on a large scale, not on a large scale. But still, you might go ahead and use bus. So I don't want to, I'm not saying anything against that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. OK, I don't think we have um, any more questions. We have a lot of uh, very positive comments on your, on your talk, uh, Gabor, from many people, uh, thanking you for this uh, really wonderful talk. Um, so I, I would like to, uh, to thank you uh, for everyone uh, among us. And um, it was really a great uh, talk. I think we all learned uh, many things about uh, grain shape. And probably you, uh, you have initiated, uh, let's hope, a new dat database on uh, a grain shape uh, obtained from beaches or anywhere else. So <laughs> thanks a lot, Gabor, for that. And um, uh, so this video will, has been recorded. So we'll put it on, uh, on YouTube if you're OK with that. And, um, and uh, OK, so that's Thank all. You. Thanks a lot, Gabor, and have a, a nice uh, evening. Thank you. Many thanks for invitation. A lot of thanks for the questions. And in particular, thanks to Ducho for jumping in for me to answer one question. <laughs> Take care. Thank you. Have a good evening. Good evening. Bye-bye.